Welcome, Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining me today for your online coffee break. Today, I'd like to welcome my special guest, Dr. Thomas Zerberkin. Thomas is the Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA. He is an award-winning astrophysicist with a strong research background in solar and heliospheric physics. I was fortunate to first meet Thomas at the Parker Solar Pro launch last August and again at the Ultima Thule flyby. But most exciting was my recent trip to NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., where Thomas sat down with me to discuss his incredible career and current responsibilities for the NASA Science Mission Directorate. Online Coffee Break. Well, Thomas, the one thing that I would love to hear is where your passion for science came from. Now, you, I know you grew up in Switzerland. I was just mm-hmm. wondering if you tell us a little bit more about that. So as opposed to many of my colleagues here, I actually grew up in a very non-technical environment. Really? All my neighbors were farmers and my father was a pastor. So really? I didn't know a single engineer and a single scientist. But what was really amazing, actually, hmm. is the recognition that I grew up out there in nature under the night sky that wow. These farmers, and you know, including my father, were really appreciating the beauty of nature. And so for me, science came from trying to understand the beauty of nature. And what I realized, the more I knew about science, mm-hmm. the more I appreciated the beauty of nature. Many people think like once you understand the night sky better, the mystery goes away. Oh no, it's the opposite. The more you know about it, the more mystery there is, the more just amazing worlds are out there that others only see a dot, I see a world. And so that's what happens when you learn science. For me, it's all about the beauty of nature and the importance of nature too. I always felt that nature was more important than any one of us. Mm -hmm. It was kind of what was part of us, but really set the stage, so to say. In many ways, the, the rules, the laws of nature, I mean, they really feel important and exploring those with the tools of science just seems like one of the most worthwhile things one could do. See, I can totally relate to that too because I'm a huge amateur astronomer by nature. I can still remember my first time getting a telescope for Christmas and of course it was cloudy for like a week yeah, after that. usually happens that way, yeah. Do you, do you remember, uh, I imagine the nights in Switzerland were, were just gorgeous. Do you remember like your first look through a telescope? Uh, so I do uh, remember of course sitting on top off the roof at my house. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, imagine a house very far away, kind of the, the number of houses around in my neighborhood are only five. Really? Uh, one street lamp, sometimes it was out, but mm-hmm. uh, so it's very, very dark. So the Milky nice. Way is not some kind of assertion you have to learn about it. Right. It's right there. When the planets come up, it feels brighter a little bit. And But then uh, the, the first big thing that I did, frankly, uh, actually a lot later, was actually working in a professional telescope. I, I volunteered to help out a guy called Wild, Paul Wild. So he was Swicky's student and he was my astronomy hmm. professor. So as a young student, I basically leapt directly. I could never afford a telescope. I didn't know anybody. Mm-hmm. But ba- when I started studying physics, I got to know this guy. And I, I volunteered during the night, cold winter nights with a coat sitting out there. And, 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 and frankly, what, what Will did is he told us all these stories, just amazing stories, and you know, like about research, about individuals, about people. Uh, I think the one of the most amazing things is the kind of intersection of nature and that exploration and the drive of explorers that are out there yeah. trying to scientists that are trying to come together with this. So I remember these nights that that will always be in front of my mind when I think about the nights going. Where did your, I guess, passion and experience with, with leading a team and motivating a team, where did that come from? You know, I, uh, as part of my Swiss upbringing, I had to be in the military. Really? Okay. Big coincidence of my life, and it really mattered. Actually, I was also an athlete. I played uh, college volleyball. Excellent. And so I became the team lead in both. And basically what I realized is that in many cases, I was actually not the best guy on the court. But if I could 
built the right environment for people to excel, we were a better team. And I realized that. And, and, and it takes some humi humility, you know. So I'm a decent scientist. I'm not the best scientist. But I know good science. And so right. basically for me, I can help science the most by really learning how to do that. And, and it takes a lot of practice. Uh, a lot of leadership learning is just like engineering, which is failing a lot of times. Yes. Like, wow, this didn't work. Like, if I really turn loud here, that didn't really work, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, like, how do I really make sure I inspire, right? And how can I help for that? How do I I encourage, lift others? Because if I do that, wow, then it works better. They're more motivated, you know? And so for me, I, I, I remember the first time that happened to me. The story is, in the military, it kind of the, the hor most horrible part of the job was after moving the older troops, somebody had to put on the barbed wire. Everybody else went to bed, and then everybody was punished during a week because they did something wrong, had to put that on, and I was the sergeant who had to put the team together. So I did that, and of course, I organized the team, went and did it. You know, we, I, I remember I sent a guy out for drinks, you know, just to make sure that we because we were working till 2 or 3 a.m., right? right? So everybody was fine. So I remember the next time, it was the pivotal moment of my life. The next time we moved, uh, basically the you know, captain stood in front of us and basically said, hey, we're gonna have to put up the barbed wire. So some soldier from the back, what they call a loser, right? A guy who always got in trouble, <laughs> said, I would like to volunteer to put up the barbed wire under one condition, Thomas is the lead. Wow. Okay. So basically, you know, here's the, the trick. If you've ever been in a good team, you'd rather do horrible work in a great team than great work in a horrible team. And so for me, once you learn that, right? So for me, I learned it kind of with scratches on my forearms and, you know, gloves on, but I learned it there. And so I've, I've, I've always carried that forward. I tried to be a student of leadership. And that, that helps me really well here because it, part of it is just the humility, right? Because you, you have to recognize you're not the best at most things, you know? And, but the goal is not, you don't have to be perfect either. The goal is that the team is perfect. And that, that's just a standard that we can aspire to. But I don't personally have to be there. That's what I believe in. You have a uh, model of the so Solar Parker Pro behind you and that's where I first met you. Um, I understand that heliophysics is a strong passion of yours too. What draws you to that field? You know, I started doing my PhD in a group that did the first experiment on the surface of the moon, which is that solar sail. It looks like aluminum foil yes. hanging from a stand. So that was actually done in Switzerland. And so I, I worked there. So basically what they did there is collected particles. So that the group where my kind of intellectual heritage is, is, is how to measure particles, learning about the history of the solar system, mm -hmm. the history of the galaxy using compositional measurements. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of largely in heliophysics, also goes over into astrophysics. So the measurements that I did were that. I learned how to build experiments. So I'm an yes. experimental physicist. I, I built some things. The first thing I ever built during my master's program, still in my is still in, in space there in, in our, in NASA's program, the wind mission, very in 1992, nice. mm -hmm. so it's, it's up there. So, so there's a whole bunch of things that I touched and affected in some cases I invented. So, and much of it was in heliophysics. That's wonderful, and I understand you had something to do a little bit with the messenger. Oh yeah, one of the sensors on the messenger mission, uh, I built together with our great team. Uh, I came up with the idea together with uh, another mentor of mine, George Gluckler, and, and kind of perfected it with a team that was a lot better than I could have been by myself. And, and it was kind of a walk-on, kind of a, what we would call here in this office, a high-risk instrument, because they had very little heritage, as I said, so we hadn't flown it before. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that instrument, in terms of just science outcome per, per money, it is in every way as big, perhaps more uh, impactful than many of the other instruments. And so, of course, it did the first measurements of the ionized exosphere. It, it measured water ions in, in Mercury's environment. It, it, it looked at pickup ions from the galactic, uh, intergalactic space. I mean, it, right. it, and solar wind and so forth. What is the goal of the Science Mission Directorate? So we really have two goals that we're doing here. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, we're NASA. We're, Every, everything then, I'm gonna talk about these goals, but how we do it is we wanna lean, right? Kind of, we deserve to only carry that NASA label if we are working in the spirit of the people who brought us here 50 years ago, which is we're trying to do new things, we're trying to do hard things. 
So our goal is actually not to be, uh, the most important goal is not to be perfect every time. Our most important goal is to have impact in two arenas, and, and so let's talk about these goals. The first one sure. is doing fundamental research. One of the way I think about the world mm -hmm. is, you know, it's like a big building, and every once in a while, a room in a room, the light comes on. So we learn about, for example, the Earth cryosphere, right? The ice on Earth, right? right. So, and we have missions like ISAT two, and you know, like other missions that combined with things on the ground and we learn about ice in a way we never learned before. Yes, it's the Earth. We discover new things at Earth. Much of the of things that remain to be discovered on Earth are still out there. They're right. still dark rooms. Well, the same is true with the universe. We can look back in time. We we would like to turn on the light in this room that says the first galaxies. Of course the way we want to do that is with James Webb. Right. Right? So basically in every case it's really about totally finding out new things, enlarging, if you want, the space in which we think and in which we live in. So that's, that's really, it's fundamental research. Even if never a startup came out of any one of those, it would still be worth it because history has shown us mm -hmm. that the big transformations in technology, the big transformations in thinking came from that kind of research, fundamental research at its core. The second type of research, I would call is applied research. Mm -hmm. So basically what it's designed to do is improve and protect life on Earth. So applied research may be measuring the weather, uh, measuring long-term yes. changes in our atmosphere. Uh, other people call that climate science. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's important, not just because it's exciting to Absolutely. learn about our planet, it relates to our livelihood. And so for me, that second part is also what NASA does. We're not the operational part. Remember NOAA, USGS, other great agencies with our international partners mm -hmm. do that operational work, the weather forecast. We built the spacecraft uh, here, but uh, they do the, the forecast. But, but it's really those two things, kind of on the one hand, kind of fundamental research leaping in our understanding, the other one applied, kind of application motivated research, right? So it's not just, applied as in I'll do a forecast, it's like I want to understand the, the laws of nature so we do a better job predicting, for example, weather three days out. Now one fundamental research question is really at the heart of many of our missions and that is a question that is we're learning a ton on right now and it has to do with is there life out there. Right. It's a very, it's a fundamental research question if there ever is one. If we found life today we would think differently about the world tomorrow. Absolutely. And so, so for us, you know, learning about that in, in many domains including planetary but also astrophysics, in many ways even heliophysics, well, how do magnetic fields mm -hmm. relate to protecting a planet? Earth science, you know, how do we model atmospheres in other words, with, with, with other kind of environments? That question is a question that keeps us up at night, uh, kind of by itself. So it's, it's one a subset of that fundamental research, but it's one of those questions I try to pull out just because there's like three or four missions right now where the key motivation for us to do it is that question. Can you tell us a little bit more? I know this is sort of a pivotal time. You mentioned the James Webb Telescope. You mentioned there are missions out there. What are the active missions in the next two or three years that you're just most excited about? It, it has to be James Webb on the one hand, right? Because James Webb is, is this, you know, tremendously difficult birth. Like I'm a father of two children. I've <laughs> stayed there. Mm -hmm. I didn't do the hard work. Uh, my wife did. But, but the point is, uh, you know, not every birth is the same. The same is true with developing missions. This one is just about as hard as we can make it. Right. But once this is up there, when it is up there, it will do amazing things and teach us about the beginning of the universe in a way we've never yeah. seen it. We've never seen that part of the universe. Like we have seen some fuzzy things kind of at the very edge of what Hubble can do. This is going to be entirely new. So that that's one of those. It's just a pivotal mission. But mm -hmm. by the way, the science we're going to do is really different than the science that was motivating the development 20 years ago. Right. Because all these exoplanets we just kind of talked about in passing, these planets out there, every star has one on the average, yes. even more than one probably. Mm -hmm. Those exoplanets, we didn't even know were there. 
certainly not at that level of abundance. So exactly. we're going to measure those at the level we never thought before. The second mission I'm really excited about What's is uh, Mars 2020. Yes. And the reason for that is it's because it's the beginning of a round trip, the first round trip to another planet. We've never gone to a planet, brought something back. Eventually, of course, what we want to do is bring people back, go land with people and bring people back. Right. Well, we're settling with a few pounds of you know, samples and so forth. Those samples, of course, what motivates us there, of course, is geology, learning about Absolutely. Mars, but it's also about life. Are there traces of extinct life in these samples? So we're landing in this environment, this river delta, that, that we hope, uh, the former river, that, of course, that we hope will have, just like on Earth, will be a site where those, those kind of answers are addressed. Uh, on Earth, they would be, but we, we don't know, uh, would be bit there. The third mission, and it's in a similar mm -hmm. realm, of course, is Europa Clipper. Europa yes. is this crazy world out there. Like, if you ever took, like, scientists all together something like 30 years ago and said, now point to everywhere where they could be like, Trust me, there's nobody who would have pointed towards uh, Europa or right. Enceladus, certainly not Enceladus, right? right? My feeling is that as we go uh, learn how to go in the outer solar system again and, and kind of investigate, kind of as a follow-up of Cassini and others, the question about life, but also the question about these unique worlds are going to really uh, open up entirely new investigations that we've not done. What are your thoughts on, on the commercial crew program? What are your vision for how humans are going to be a part of space exploration over the next few years? So what's really unique, right, is that uh, we can get Americans launched from the U.S. to space yes. uh, with U.S. providers. That's really a unique thing after so and so many years after the shuttle retired. We've used, you know, worked with our collaborators in, in Russia. So so the commercial crew program, I think, is kind of a very courageous program yeah. uh, that has been with us for you know, several administrations, you know, it, it, like so many things at NASA have bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on how this goes, we may have three options to go back to space, right? Kind of the, uh, the two commercial crew providers mm -hmm. and, and perhaps the uh, space launch system. That exactly. The NASA provided uh, kind of heavy launch capability. Mm -hmm. So as we go build those things, you know, the most important element is that it really, the, the sky becomes more open for Americans and our partners to go to space. Uh, I mean, uh, we're excited that we've been in space for 18 years nonstop, right? There's many yes. people alive, including my children, have not, not lived on this earth a single day where an, uh, an American was not in space. And so we have to say that too. That's the benefit of the space station, you know, a kind of a, it's, it's a miracle made reality, kind of coming together as an international community and building that up. I think what's going to happen as we go to the moon and beyond, uh, that international community will be partnered by commercial players and kind of new things will happen. And, and again, a courageous uh, way that is at the heart of the commercial crew program to really open up uh, kind of the space for us, the exploration space of humans deeper and deeper into uh, the solar system. We've only been, you know, mostly in low Earth orbit. We, it's time yeah. to take humans out of there and go deeper. How do you maintain the, the missions and the future of, of science with, with the constantly changing budgets? How do you keep the long-term focus on science? So one of the key elements of that strategy is to have a constancy of purpose. Right. Uh, by the way, the way we do that is to recognize that whoever sits in this office here and as our headquarters is not the person who sets the purpose relative to what's the key highest priority science mission. Mm -hmm. That's the National Academy of Science, an invention many, many years ago, and, and kind of the academies are helping us kind of setting priority. And of course, in heliophysics, there's domains where I'm pretty good at setting priority, just mm -hmm. because I've worked there for 20 years or more. Well, in astrophysics, I'm not the best specialist on, on Earth. And, and frankly, it's kind of figuring, it's hard to figure out what the best specialist, who it is, right, one should talk to. And the answer is you need to bring a team together mm -hmm. and kind of prioritize based on principles that are much higher. So constancy of purpose is one of them that brings us forward. So Correct. kind of administrations change, we still do, we do the right thing, continue it. So we don't waste taxpayers' money because we crank back and forth. We just keep yeah. going because we have agreed together in a bipartisan way that that's what needs to be done. I think the other thing I just said is the bipartisan support. I really believe that's crucial that we learn how to communicate science 
not just for one stakeholder. Uh, yes, there's smart people who are really excited about science. I'm just as excited to talk to uh, elementary school students, to uh, middle school students, to so people who are doing apprenticeships, you know, in, in, in community colleges. They're also voters and they also live in the same beautiful nature we are in. And, and if we cannot talk to them about what we're doing, shame on us. Obviously, NASA has international partners. You know, we've partnered with Russia. Uh, you recently uh, went to uh, United Arab Emirates. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how uh, what it is working with other world space authorities and space agencies. So the one thing that is really critical to think about is that uh, when it comes to NASA, leadership and collaboration are not opposing values. Mm -hmm. Kind of, we're the leaders. Uh, there's no other program that it really is where we are. But see, sustained leadership doesn't require just that we're a leader now, it's also that we're moving faster. And so for me, like, I mean, I, I learned that from Larry Page, the founder of Google. Oh, yes. He basically says, like, who cares about where we are right now? The question is, are we moving faster? Oh, I love that, yes. And, and so, kind of his way of saying, it's not the quantity that matters, it's the first derivative of that quantity, right? Sure. Kind of this, what's the mm -hmm. slope? And so, so for me, that collaboration with international partners uh, enables us to do things that otherwise we could not do and do things better. Because some things, like for example, Earth observations, mm -hmm. we should all contribute. It's not the goal that we keep right. doing what we did 20, 30 years ago. The goal is that we, again, we're NASA, we leap. But some pe we empower some others to kind of help contribute. And as we put the data out there, other, whether it's commercial or international partners, put the data out and we can build the next measurement and so forth. And so for, for me, international uh, collaborations from the beginning of NASA has been a really important part of the, the definition of what we're about. Uh, if you look at the Space Act, it's right there. And uh, I think this entire team believes in that. That's wonderful. Thomas, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Thank you so much. Thanks to you and for all your work you're doing. Oh, my pleasure. Online Coffee Break. Wow, I really enjoyed my conversation with Thomas today. I hope you did too. If you'd like to find out more about the NASA Science Mission Directorate, just visit their website, science.nasa.gov. I want to thank Thomas for joining me today. I'd like to thank you for joining us as well. If you'd like to comment on today's topic, just go to our website, onlinecoffeebreak.com. Or we'd love it if you'd follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Online Coffee Break. We'd also love it if you'd share this episode with a friend or rate us on your favorite podcast application. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. We'll see you next time. God bless.